everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to today's virtual tour from Jaffa 1948 to Gaza 2024 with the Green Olive Collective and Zohot. My name is Eris Bleicher and I'm the Membership and Advocacy Director of the Green Olive Collective, an advocacy, information, and tour guiding center committed to a democratic future and an end to the ongoing displacement of Palestinians. We provide communities around the world with insights into the segregation policies of the occupation and the resources to engage in meaningful advocacy with Palestinians. Your contributions for today's event will be split between Zuchot and the Green Olive Collective and go to sustain both of our efforts to raise local and transnational awareness about the violence of the ongoing Nakba, to fundamentally shift the landscape of discourse around Israel-Palestine and advance an expansive and robust vision of justice. We need contributions from you, our wider community, in order to cover the costs of this event and work to amplify the voices of Palestinian and Israeli human rights defenders calling for a permanent ceasefire and an end to collective punishment. You can donate at greenolivetours.com slash contributions, which I put into the chats moments ago. We are honored to host today's tour with Sohort, an organization that has worked since 2002 to, in their own words, fracture the walls of denial about the ongoing Nakba promote historical memory and awareness about the events of 1948 and promote the right of return for Palestinian refugees. In a political climate in which discussion of the Nakba is often made taboo and increasingly censured and actively criminalized by the Israeli government, Zuchot plays a truly pivotal role in the movement to end displacement and in the promotion of human rights. They are tireless in their efforts to honestly and sensitively address and redress the origins of violence in Israel-Palestine. Umar al-Ghubari, our presenter and tour guide today, is a researcher, political educator, and a lecturer on Palestinian history, identity, Nakba, and return. He works with Sahut, promoting acknowledgement and accountability for the ongoing injustices of the Nakba and a reconceptualization of return as an imperative redress of the Nakba. Umar regularly coordinates and guides tours in depopulated Palestinian localities inside Israel. He also edited a collection of vignettes and short stories that I adore and admire called Auda, Imagined Testimonies from Possible Futures, Imagining a Future After Palestinian Refugees Are Allowed to Return. Today, he will guide us on a virtual tour and lecture about the history of Jaffa, the largest and most important city in Palestinian society before 1948, and its past and present relationship to Gaza, where many refugees from Jaffa settled after 1948 in a district area called the Jabalia refugee camp. Uma, thank you for your time. It's truly, truly appreciated. Uh, the last two things I'll say before passing over to you is firstly, that as soon as Uma begins our virtual tour and the presentation today, uh, the floor is open to questions that I will collect and integrate into a question and answer period at the end. So as the presentation and the tour continues, please type your questions into the chat with a dash or colon afterwards so I know to look for them and I'll collect them to integrate them into the conversation at the end of the tour. Uh, and lastly, during the tour, I'll be sending in the chat a few translations of quotes. Uh, so look for those throughout as well. Uh, and with that, really again, sincere thanks, Mamaf, and I'll pass to you. Are you able to unmute? Yes. <clears throat> Beautiful. Thank wow. you, Aris. Thank you for inviting me to do this joint virtual tour and talking about the Nakba and the ongoing Nakba and the history of the city of Jaffa um, and the actual relevant um, ongoing gen genocide in Gaza in these days and the relationship between the two locations through the short history in the modern history, um, mainly. Uh, I will try to share my PowerPoint. Please just confirm that you see it. Yes, we do. Great, thank you. Uh, what I will try to do is to um, make very fast 
uh, presentation to cover part of the history of the city of Jaffa and to tell the um, uh, the Zionist Palestinian relationship through the story of the city of Jaffa and uh, um, maybe to connect that to the um, what's going in in Gaza. So I will show you I'll sh I'll share with you um, some pictures from the past and pictures from the present in order just to um, um, clarify uh, the story, not only in words, but also by visions and images uh, that we can see. Um, so um, the two sisters we can call Jaffa and Gaza, both are very uh, historic uh, cities on the Mediterranean, on the um, in, in Palestine. Uh, both of them were uh, founded at least during the Canaanite time and they both passed the old periods of history that we know that passed on Palestine like the other uh, cities. But our focus will be in the modern history and the uh, mainly in the 1948 um, events and expulsion of the city of um, uh, of Jaffa. Uh, during the uh, British mandate that started in Palestine practically in 1917, 18, when the British army occupied Palestine, but formally in 1920, when the United Nations gave the mandate uh, to Britain in, 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 in Palestine, the administration of the British government divided Palestine to different districts, and Jaffa was the capital of one of these districts, and also Gaza was a capital of one of the districts. So if you can see on the map, the district of Gaza, which is much bigger than what we know today as Gaza Strip, it's not the same, <clears throat> the same area and the same uh, size. And we see the city, the, uh, the district of Jaffa in the center of the uh, coastal um, area. And even we can see that the district of Gaza is much bigger than the coastal, the, the district of Jaffa at that time. The story of the Nakba in general and the, uh, the story of Jaffa will be uh, given in the wider context of the uh, history of Palestine uh, during the mandate, the British mandate and, um, and maybe the late Ottoman uh, time. But uh, I will stop by different important historical stations that um, I think will uh, be very relevant to the story of uh, the city of Jaffa and, of course, the whole story of Palestine in 1948. One of them is 1917 uh, Balfour de Declaration, uh, when uh, the British government sent this letter to one of the Zionist figures, the Zionist leaders, the Lord Rothschild promising him to create a Jewish home in Palestine, um, 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 despite that uh, this promise was given in very uh, early time, in, in February 1917, when the population in Palestine was more than 90% uh, are Palestinian, were Palestinians and less than 10% were Jewish, but this didn't uh, uh, stop Mr. Balfour uh, to deal with the Jewish people and the non-Jewish communities. He even didn't deal with the Palestinians as a nation or as a people, he dealt with them as uh, non-Jewish communities. So we can say that already in the meaning of this text, between the lines, we can realize and we can see the seeds of the Nakba, the seeds of the catastrophe that will uh, um, be committed in Palestine, because if you have this promise and this ideology, it will not happen uh, normally. And uh, 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 of course, the indigenous people will not accept that. Um, in, in, without any resistance. During the uh, British mandate, there were some offers to uh, solve the problems between Jews and Palestinians in Palestine. And as the, um, the uh, regular fast colonial uh, offers, 
the uh, the idea of dividing Palestine to two states uh, came up, and uh, since the early 30s, uh, we have already some uh, different ideas to divide Palestine to two states, one Jewish state, one Arab state. We know for sure, and during the whole period, the Palestinians uh, objected uh, the idea of partitioning plan, regardless if it was fair dividing or a uh, good uh, uh, partition or, or, or not. They, 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 they rejected the idea of dividing their homeland uh, with, uh, with the Zionist movement. And, and at the same time, we know formally that the Zionist movement accepted the partition plan. But historians could go a little bit uh, um, deeper in the uh, in the history and the texts. And uh, um, sorry, I will jump to this one um, in, in order to see if the Zionist movement and what the Zionist movement said uh, regarding the partition plan. Um, in... Just a minute, I will see this quote. Uh, actually, this the quote of uh, air is uh, the translation will be uh, delivered in, in chat. So, yeah, um, we we have two important quotes regarding the partition plan in the eyes of the Zionist leaders, the Zionist uh, movement leaders in 1937 already. David Ben Gurion himself said that uh, a partial Jewish state. He means that. In Jewish state, just in part of the land of Israel, just in, in smaller part in, in Palestine, will not be the end, it will be the beginning. And he said that already in 1937. He said, we will create a strong country, we will bring um, as much as possible Jews from all over the world, we create a strong economy, a strong army, and then no one will prevent us of controlling the other parts of the land. When he said the land, he meant the land of Israel, uh, and at that time, of course, the the, the Palestinian uh, and territory under the British mandate. At the same year, even Chaim Weizmann, who became the first president of the state of Israel, said something similar. He sent a letter to the British governor, and he said, uh, uh, "A partial Jewish state. It's just an arrangement for twenty-five to thirty years, and then we will." Continue controlling the other parts of the uh, of the state of um, uh, of Israel. The ideas of uh, partition moved from um, uh, giving in the beginning only maybe twenty percent for the Jewish state and uh, uh, fifty percent to the Palestinian state, and the fifty percent will be international zone. It moved to other. Uh, um, different kinds of uh, um, of uh, of partition. Um, for example, the the map of Peel Commit Peel Commission in 1937. Um, on your left, you can see uh, the colors of the offered uh, Jewish state and the pink one. Sorry, yeah, the the uh, offered Arab state and the international zone in yellow in the middle. All the ideas, by the way, included international zone. What is relevant to our story now for Gaza and Jaffa, both cities, Jaffa, Jaffa and Gaza, in the whole ideas of partitioning plans were outside of the Jewish states. Even Jaffa in the... Um, in the uh, partition plan that was that was uh, approved in the United Nations in November 1947, Jaffa was kind of enclave inside the Jew the offer Jewish state. Even in this uh, um, map, um, Jaffa was not part of the uh, of the Jewish state. Of course, Gaza never was um, in these offers in these propo proposals. Uh, part of the uh, of the Jewish state, but if we uh, stop by the uh, the last uh, partition plan um, that was approved by the United Nations in 1947, 
uh, even if you want to accept that as, as Palestinian or as any human being, uh, seeing the objective um, uh, facts on the ground, you will see that this map was actually not fair and not applicable and of course not democratic. The committee that checked the idea of partition plan came, visited Palestine, and it checked among the people that live in Palestine their positions, their, uh, their uh, uh, acceptance to the partition plan, and the majority said no. Despite that, the committee went with the minority and not with the majority. The map gave to the Jewish minority that was about 600,000 people more than 50% of the land. And the Palestinians that were 1 million point three uh, got only 43% of the, of the land of Palestine. And 2% were kept as international zone, which is Jerusalem and Beit, um, um, and Beit Lahim as, as, as holy sites. So even if you want to check objectively the map, it was really problematic map. Uh, for implementing on the um, on the ground. Beside that, and the, adding to the quote that I mentioned of David Ben Gurion in 1937 and Chaim Weizmann at the same year, we have in the Zionist literature many quotes that talk about uh, transferring the Palestinians outside of the Jewish state. These quotes uh, um, were given. In, in 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 the in, in Herzl book in um, um, the uh, the old new land in translation simple translation to English, um, it was uh, said by Israel Zanvin in nineteen o five. It was said by Joseph Reitz, one of the important persons in the JNF. In, in the early 40s. Uh, it was said by David Ben-Gurion himself um, and other Zionist leaders that talked about the need of transferring the Palestinians or the Arabs, they didn't call them, of course, Palestinians. They, they, they defined them Arabs or just tribes or just Muslims to transfer them out of the, uh, of the Jewish state that will be created um, in the coming years. Israel Sandwich, for example, said in 1905, we must be prepared either to expel with the sword the tribes living in the country as our forefathers did, or to address the question of the migration of the foreign populations, foreign populations who are mostly Muslims. Similar things were um, uh, said many times by the Zionist leaders, these quotes and this Zionist literature is very important to try to understand or to analyze what happened really in 1948, because the Zionist argument said we didn't expel people, we didn't force people to leave, but the, the, the numbers talk by themselves, and we see that more than 85% uh, uh, of the Palestinian population that's supposed to live inside the Green Line, inside the area that became the state of Israel, were expelled and became refugees. And their return was prevented since that time till today. So these things couldn't be done by mistake or by chance or without any plan or any... Um, um, in, Initiate, initiative uh, uh, acts uh, by the uh, Zionist movement in, before May 15th and by the Israeli army after May 15th. So more than 75,000 75, Palestinians became refugees in 1947, 48, 49, 50, 51. These years are very important to uh, um, um, to put in our mind because the expulsion of the Palestinian population didn't happen during clashes or during war. It happened after the war ended and it happened before the war started. The formal war between Israel and the Arab countries started in May 15th, 
till May 15th, we are already with 40% of expulsions and occupations uh, um, of the Palestinian population by the Zionist uh, movement. Um, uh, some of these Palestinian communities were expelled in 1950, like the city, 51, like the city of Majdal, which is Ashkelon, which is relevant also to the uh, uh, current story with, with Gaza. Um, the village of Zakaria, close to Beit Shemesh, um, uh, west of Jerusalem, was expelled also in 1950-51. Uh, Bedouin communities were internally expelled in 1960s, 1970s, and even till today, there are uh, much pressure on Bedouin Palestinian communities in the Negev, in the Naqab, in order to confiscate their lands and to move them to new uh, townships that the, uh, the State of Israel will uh, build for them. And of course, in the West Bank, in these days, thousands of Palestinians had been expelled forcibly from their lands towards uh, the big cities. Uh, the area of south of Hebron, Masafar Yatta, and other areas are under serious dangers of and threat of, uh, of expulsion. And some communities were already expelled in the last five months under the cover of the current war on on, on Gaza. So the result of the uh, Zionist and the Israeli occupations of Palestinian towns and villages was real catastrophe uh, because more than 600 Palestinian cities and towns and villages were expelled and erased and destroyed or colonized after 1948. Only 150,000 Palestinians survived the expulsion and became are part of the state of Israel, citizens of the state of Israel. If we will have time, we'll talk even about these 150,000 because not all of them um, really survived the expulsion. Um, at least 25% of them are internally displaced people uh, inside the Green Line, despite they are citizens of the state of Israel. <clears throat> we still don't have the uh, holistic Zionist plan that describes the uh, um, um, uh, the organized actions or the organized plan of ethnic cleansing. But we do have some small uh, pieces of this puzzle of the whole picture, uh, some documents from the Israeli uh, archives, some testimonies of Palestinians and Israelis uh, uh, talk about the way how these communities were expelled. And as I said again in the beginning, in uh, um, the expulsion didn't happen uh, only uh, during war or uh, bombing. It happened through direct orders by the Israeli army to civilians, to communities, to leave their places and, uh, um, and afterward, these places were destroyed and erased. Uh, this document, for example, from November 1948, uh, talk about uh, the villages in the area that became in these days under the title, the envelope of Gaza, the areas inside Israel in the west part of the, uh, of the Naqab, of the, of the Negev, and uh, uh, some of these areas were attacked by Hamas in the 7th of October attack, uh, like the small uh, kibbutzes and small Israeli communities, Be'eri uh, and, uh, um, and the, the other uh, kibbutzes maybe were not in the news, like Erez and Kisofim and other uh, Israeli settlements. But in 1948, these villages were occupied and the communities were expelled toward Gaza. It happened that some weeks or months after the first expulsion, some of the families returned to their villages. So this Israeli document from the Israeli army talk about uh, uh, this information that uh, they got uh, um, in, in, in the text number one movement of Arab civilians. And notice they are talking about civilians, not, they are not talking about armed people or, uh, um, or soldiers. Uh, movement of Arab civilians from Gaza 
uh, northward to the village of Majdal, which is Ashkelon today, has been observed. The Arabs have settled in a number of villages and become established there. The mission that the army gave to the troops, expulsion of the Arab refugees from these from the uh, from these villages and preventing their return by demolishing the villages. And how they will do that, the method in uh, uh, in number three um, said sweep the villages of Hamama, Jora, Khirbat Khsas, Ni'ilya, Aljia, Barbara, Beit Jirja, Herbia, Dairisnaid. All these are names of expelled and destroyed Palestinian villages in 1948. And uh, um, assembled their uh, residents to load them onto the uh, cars and uh, deport them to Gaza. They have to be led up to beyond our lines in Beit Hanun. Beit Hanun is in Gaza Strip uh, today. I will jump just to the um, uh, number um, C, uh, burn the villages and demolish the stone houses. And E said, trace the roads of the roads that they used, the refugees used, and mine those roads. So these practices that had been done already in 1948 in order to prevent the return of the people of, uh, uh, of Palestine that had been expelled, um, as he said, in different means, in different ways, forcibly outside of, uh, of Palestine. So in this context, the, uh, um, the area of Jaffa, the city of Jaffa and the villages around the city of Jaffa were also attacked and occupied. As we, uh, uh, we know already that Jaffa was the biggest and the most important city in Palestine. This is a map of the uh, neighborhoods of the city of Jaffa. In your right, you will see the southern uh, um, neighborhood that called Manshia or Al Manshia. It, it, it will be a central story in the uh, in my presentation. Uh, very close to Tel Aviv, um, and then the other neighborhoods like Rashid and Al Barriya and the old city and Al Nuzha and Al Ajami and Jabalia. And here we have a name of a neighborhood in Jaffa that called Jabalia. It's very similar to the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. It's, it looks that the same name was given to both areas pre-1948, one in Jaffa, one in Gaza. We know for sure from the modern history of Jaffa that some families moved from Gaza to Jaffa and some families from Jaffa moved to live in Gaza. So these two cities were really in good relationship uh, um, uh, in trade and in, 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 in visits and also in uh, um, uh, uh, relationship between families. Some of the families lived in Jaffa and some of the families lived in, uh, in Gaza even before 1948, but the way between both cities was open all the time. All these neighborhoods that I mentioned, except the old city, considered as the modern Jaffa. The modern Jaffa, when we talk about the modern Jaffa, we talk about the neighborhoods that were built since 1860s and afterwards. Why 1860? Because the uh, Ottoman Empire um, canceled the law that prevented people to build houses or neighborhoods outside old cities, outside the walls. It was a law in the whole empire and it was canceled in 1860. So in 10, 1860s, we see the old cities that used to live only inside walls starting to expand and to be developed uh, in the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, like uh, Jerusalem and uh, Safed and uh, Tiberias and uh, other cities inside walls and Dhaka and Acre, and of course, Jaffa.
in the modern Jaffa, we will see uh, these beautiful buildings that were built in 1870s, 1890s. Um, for example, the clock tower, the famous clock tower in the center of Jaffa till today was built in 1901 uh, when the uh, Ottoman Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid II uh, commemorated or, or celebrated actually uh, 25 years of his sultanism uh, in the uh, Ottoman Empire. And uh, in, in the photo in the bottom and your left with this a huge building with four huge pillars is the front of the Saraya, the palace, the residency of the governor during the Ottoman time. And during the British time, part of the time it was the municipal uh, uh, area, uh, the municipal building. And later on in the 30s and the 40s, it was just uh, a public space uh, served different organizations uh, in the city of, um, uh, of Jaffa. Uh, the building of the, the modern Saraya that was built in 1980 in the, uh, in the bottom of the left of the screen, very important, uh, try to remember this uh, photo, and also the building of the bank on, in, on our right, on the top of the, um, uh, of the uh, screen, uh, this is uh, one of the banks that were built in the area of the Saraya and the clock tower because this was really the center and the heart of the modern city of, uh, um, of Jaffa. Uh, these two buildings, the bank and the Saraya, uh, will be mentioned again in 1948 when they were attacked um, by one of the Zionist groups. Uh, the city was developed as a city of culture. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful buildings in Jaffa that was um, uh, built in the uh, early 30s that called the Theater of Alhamra or Alhamra. Uh, by the way, the building is still existing till today and it, it's used for different purposes. But for many years till 1948, this was a theater and a cinema. And uh, uh, this photo in, in our right from 1935 shows, first of all, the Palestinian flag on the top of the building and the, um, um, the poster of one of the Egyptian films um, that was screened inside the hall of the cinema. Um, I can recognize the actor. I think it's Anwar Wajdi, one of the most famous uh, Egyptian uh, actors at that time. Inside the hall, we see one of the uh, orchestras that the uh, students of uh, Jaffa uh, played inside, uh, inside the hall. Um, announcing uh, famous singers from the Arab world that um, arrived to Jaffa and other cities in Palestine um, uh, to sing or to show um, and it, it's, of course, for um, Arab readers and Palestinians will be very excited to read um, the, um, the announcement of um, Um Kulthum um, appearance in Palestine in 1935. The, this one with the photo of this lady. This is the famous singer from Egypt, Um Kulthum, uh, that um, uh, actually made um, the, the appearance of uh, the new songs starting from Cairo, Alexandria, passing to uh, Jerusalem, Jaffa, Haifa, Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad. So the Palestinian um, um, sphere was part in this open space of the Arab world and the Middle East uh, till 1948. And um, by the way, in Jaffa, there were at least six cinema houses in the city of Jaffa. Um, and they were at least in the um, in, in about 10 years in the late 30s and the early 40s, 70 newspapers were printed daily in Jaffa. Uh, most of them in Arabic, one at least in English and were distributed all over the towns and the villages in, in Palestine. In the center of the screen, you will see a boy selling the newspaper that called Palestine, Palestine newspaper, the two famous uh, newspapers were Palestine and the Difa, the Difa, which means the defense. 
in the in Hebrews the Haganah. It's the same name of the Israeli of the Zionist militia that called the Haganah led by David Ben Gurion, uh, by the way. Um, but it's not connected to him. It was a Palestinian newspaper, and in this newspaper, people uh, published. Uh, news and articles and uh, uh, social uh, uh, ideas and, and, and articles and commercial uh, um, news. Uh, Jaffa was known as a, a city with many um, industry and in very interesting way also with agriculture, mainly uh, millions of trees of oranges were planted in Palestine in general, most of them in the area of Jaffa and the area of Romley and Led and the coastal area. Um, different types of uh, uh, factories uh, were in, 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 the, in the city of Jaffa and of course the famous seaport that served the city of Jaffa but also connected Palestine through Jaffa to the whole world. Pilgrims that came to visit Jerusalem to the holy city for, Christi for Christians, they came through the sea uh, to Jaffa port and then they um, continued to the train station that was built in 1892 during the Ottoman time, very close to Al Manshiya neighborhood, the southern part of the city of Jaffa. Um, and this uh, train actually uh, used also the pilgrims from the seaport of Jaffa to the holy city of Jerusalem. And it was connecting in the beginning uh, the uh, Jaffa with Jerusalem and later on Jaffa with Haifa and other cities in Palestine and from Haifa to the other parts of the Middle East to Beirut and to Halep and to um, Aleppo and to Istanbul and other places. And on the other side to Gaza, to Al-Arish and to Egypt, to Port Said of uh, of Egypt. So the uh, the city of Jaffa was one of the evidences that uh, um, the urban life in Palestine was really alive. Uh, by the way, uh, usually the the, um, the the vision towards the Palestinian population um, consider the Palestinians as farmers. Uh, the Zionist movement used that term. Uh, not in positive way even describe them just um, just workers in the in the land or just farmers but in fact 30 percent of the Palestinian people lived in big cities and in towns they lived urban life so the uh, um, the Palestinian people was in a process of collective identity creating, uh, in, in, in different levels, political, cultural, uh, economical, uh, geographical. Um, but despite that, the Zionist eyes didn't see Palestine as I described uh, just now. They uh, tried to convince people that the land is empty and it's not uh, developed at all. Well, it was developed as the Middle East was developed or not developed. It was part of the um, uh, um, Middle Eastern processes. Um, but worse than that, the uh, specifically to Jaffa, some Jewish community lived in Jaffa. Uh, in the modern history, in the in the in the second half of the nineteenth century, or a little bit after. Uh, there was a small Jewish community living in Jaffa. Uh, in the uh, early years of 1920s, more and more Jews lived also in Jaffa, mainly uh, following the immigration waves from Europe uh, to, uh, to Palestine. But the, uh, the Zionist leaders didn't like the idea of um, the status that Jaffa uh, got as an important city and uh, um, developed city. And uh, then some, some Jewish families, uh, by the way, till 19, uh, um, 
in 1980s, sorry, in 18, 1890s, the Ottoman, in the Ottoman time, when some of Palestinian neighborhoods were built around the old city, some Jewish neighborhoods also were built as a part of Jaffa, like Neve Shalom, uh, um, Neve Tzedek, uh, Kerem Atimanim, all these Hebrew names of Jewish neighborhoods were actually part of Jaffa. In 1906, some Zionist group came with the idea to build a new neighborhood in Jaffa, and they started building a neighborhood called Achuzat Bayit. And this neighborhood in the 1920-21 became the city of Tel Aviv. Actually, Tel Aviv was built in the beginning as a neighborhood of Jaffa. So imagine what position we have today for Tel Aviv and what uh, neglected position we have to Jaffa. And this was the opposite in, in the beginning of the 20th uh, century. Um, so some of the um, um, Zionist uh, figures at that time, they were played played a good role in building Tel Aviv and building the Chuzat Bayit. And at that time, uh, I wrote about something interesting about Jaffa. So Eris, if you can share, please, the translation of these quotes about uh, Jaffa, if you have them. Um, the sorry, you did. Okay. Um, so or, already in 1906, uh, Akiva Weiss um, was one of the initiators of the Ahuzat Bayit, the neighborhood that became uh, Tel Aviv. He complained that 96% uh, 96 of the Jews that live in the city of Jaffa actually renting houses from uh, Arab owners and they paid them the money and he didn't like the idea that the money goes to strangers, to the Palestinians or to the Arabs. He said, let's do it the opposite. Let's build uh, for ourselves uh, uh, houses and let the uh, Jewish families live in these uh, in these houses or we, rent, we will rent houses for Jewish families and we will get benefit from um, uh, this rental um, um, houses. Uh, we have to buy uh, a plot of land very close to Jaffa and it will become the first Hebrew city uh, that only how do you say that? Hebraized or uh, I, don't, I don't see the translation but Okay. Yeah, it will be the first, the first Hebrew city where when one hundred percent Hebrews will live. Uh, they will speak Hebrew and they will maintain purity and cleanliness. Clean. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we will not follow the ways of the uh, Gentiles of the. Uh, um, of course, the, the Palestinians of um, uh, of Jaffa. And David Ben-Gurion himself um, predicted that the uh, city of Jaffa will, um, uh, will be destroyed. Do you have it? <clears throat> Yes, it's above the, the yeah, port the of yeah. Akiva Weiss. Thank you. The destruction of Jaffa, the city and the port, let it come. Um, by the way, remember this quote because it will be mentioned again in the end of the uh, of the lecture uh, regarding uh, in, uh, Gaza. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, even he, he, he used that term here in Hebrew, it will go to hell. Uh, if if the city of Jaffa will go to hell, I will not feel mourning on, uh, um, on it. Um, so how, how important he saw creating a Hebrew city, a Jewish city uh, that will replace uh, Jaffa in, in the Mediterranean, he wanted 
Jewish C, uh, pure Jewish C uh, instead of, uh, of Jaffa. So this approach towards Jaffa from the colonial superior uh, uh, position uh, towards the indigenous people of the city of Jaffa um, uh, reflected um, that the coming years and the tension between the Jewish Zionist community and the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian city. And um, um, since the early 20s, there were some uh, points in the um, uh, history of Jaffa and Tel Aviv that faced clashes between the Palestinians and uh, the um, uh, and sometimes with the Jewish communities, sometimes with the uh, militias like the Haganah and the Etzel and the Lehi, the Irgun and other Zionist, uh, Zionist groups. So Jaffa was the real capital of Palestine. So it was also uh, expressed by political uh, uh, activism, by resistance to the British colonialism and the Zionist movement. And some of these resistant actions and steps uh, were developed to clashes with the Jewish uh, uh, communities in, uh, around the city uh, of Jaffa. But all of these um, clashes that I mentioned, the important ones of them in 1921, 1924, uh, 29, uh, uh, 34, and of course in the Great Revolt in Palestine of the Palestinians between 1936-1930. Uh, 39, uh, each one and every uprising that the Palestinians uh, started had just uh, um, um, a startup uh, that uh, caused that. It was not planned in advance in a, a, a cool decision. It was just um, um, things that happened um, uh, following, uh, for example, in 19... Uh, 21, the march of the 1st of May that came from Tel Aviv and the demonstrators uh, insisted to enter the al manshiya neighborhood and to go through the Palestinian neighborhood and the Palestinians didn't like that and they didn't want that. So it started like a, uh, um, uh, a small clash between, because of this demonstration and it was developed to wider clashes. But the report of the uh, British police, for example, regarding the events of 1921 said that the Jewish immigrants insult Arab society with their uh, um, arrogance uh, um, towards the, the Palestinian or the Arab society, the Arab community. This was in the report of the uh, commission that uh, investigated the events of 1921. Uh, uh, in the 1924, uh, the Palestinians understood the uh, uh, the march of the uh, celebration or the celebration of Purim uh, uh, holiday um, as a kind of humiliating the Arab or the Palestinian culture by uh, pretending or, or dressing uh, Arab or Palestinian clothes. So every, every event like that, we had a small um, um, cause, a small reason that caused the big and the wide uh, classes in, in many times, it was really uh, a tough ones. In 1929, which is known as the um, um, Al-Burak uprising, it started as demonstrations and uh, uprising against what the Palestinians thought British decision uh, to give more uh, advantages for the Jewish community in the holy site around the al Aqsa Mosque, which is the Western Wall. Um, um, and these demonstrations were developed to clashes, and uh, some of them were very brutal and very difficult, like the massacre against the Jewish community in Hebron and attacking the Jewish community in Safed and in Jerusalem. Uh, so in this year, 130, about 160 Jews were killed, but at the same time, a uh, similar number of Palestinians were killed also by the British police and the, uh, the Zionist armed, uh, armed groups. By the way, in, in Hebron, beside the brutal 
attack of some uh, uh, Palestinians on the Jewish community. There were some fa Palestinian families that saved Jewish, Jewish families and they hid them in their houses in order to protect them uh, um, from any uh, other attack. Um, the, uh, the Great Revolt in 19, that finished in 1939 was actually kind of um, 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 first course of the Nakba when the British government smashed the leadership of the Palestinian people. We talk about just eight years before 1948, and uh, uh, the Palestinians in the end of this revolt uh, were actually destroyed society with no leadership. Most of the leadership were killed or arrested or uh, uh, expelled outside of, of, uh, of Palestine. So from that time, that time till 1948, the 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 events that were planned by Britain and the Zionist movement uh, had very good chances to succeed because of the uh, conditions of the Palestinian uh, um, uh, community conditions at that time. After the approval of the United Nations the, uh, partition plan, the Palestinians declared three days of total strike in Palestine, and they went out to demonstrate against the, uh, uh, the partition plan. The uh, next day, they attacked some Jewish shops and stores and houses in Jewish neighborhoods, and it was uh, uh, spread to wide clashes in all uh, in all Palestine, but at the same time, things that we don't learn and we don't hear uh, much that some of the Zionist groups started already in December 1947 to attack Palestinian communities also, and uh, um, in, it happened in Jerusalem in the village of Lifta in order to um, conquer Jerusalem despite it was outside of the Jewish state according to the partition plan. And also the attacks on the city of Jaffa started in the end of December, in the end of 1947, despite the fact that Jaffa also was out uh, uh, of the, Jew the, the offered uh, Jewish state according to the partition plan. The organization that called the Irgun or the Etzel attacked um, in Jaffa uh, in December 7 and burned uh, houses of Palestinians in some of the neighborhood of, uh, uh, of Jaffa. They threw um, um, a TNT uh, can to the Alhambra cinema that we saw the photo of the theater uh, before in King George Street. Um, the uh, organization that called the Lehi or Stern organization attacked these two buildings, Asaraya, the residency of the governor. Do you see this building in the center of the black, white, black and white uh, photo with the four pillars? This is the Saraya that we mentioned before. And close to the Saraya, there is the bank, the Barclays Bank. Members of the uh, Stern organization had a car with uh, um, um, 500 kilograms of uh, um, TNT and they parked the car between these two buildings and they exploded the buildings in January 1948. They claimed that the building was the center of the High Arab Committee in Jaffa. In fact, it was not there. Before, few months before that, it was one of these offices used the, the committee, but in January 1948, the committee was not uh, um, uh, operating any part of this uh, of this building. 20, 28 people were killed in this attack. All of them were civilians, and this was in January 1948. We talk in very early time regarding the May 1948, the formal war uh, between Israel and the Arab countries. So these attacks caused gradual expulsions and terror and fear among the Palestinian communities. These two photos of the uh, Saraya, you see this, the Saraya building was totally destroyed except these four pillars 
that were renovated a few years ago, uh, showing the front of the Saraya building, um, but the building itself is not existing uh, anymore, and of course not the uh, the building of the uh, of the bank. So these uh, local attacks took place from December to uh, April uh, 1948. And uh, in the 25 of April 1948, the Ergun organization started an organized and wide attack on the neighborhood of Jaffa uh, that called Manshi. This neighborhood that we see over here, the Al Manshiya neighborhood, the closest one uh, to Tel Aviv, and in the uh, uh, far part of the photo, we see the old city of Jaffa with the tower of the St. Peter Church in the center of the old city uh, of Jaffa. So this attack in the 25th of April on the city of Jaffa, uh, by the way, it took place from the uh, yard of one of the Jewish schools that were in uh, close to uh, the uh, the neighborhood of Jaffa, uh, and they actually um, missiled uh, um, not only the neighborhood of Jaffa, but also the other parts of the city, like the clock tower uh, area and the uh, and the old city uh, of Jaffa. And um, this will show us um, two things. First of all, the uh, the gap between the power of the Zionist uh, uh, groups, militias, before 1948 and the Palestinian side. The Palestinians were not prepared and organized and well armed in order to uh, protect or to defend uh, their locations and their uh, localities. Uh, even the biggest city and the strongest city of Jaffa that tried in the beginning to fight back against the attack on the city, but they didn't succeed uh, um, as we will see very, uh, very soon. Um, the other thing is that the, uh, the, the goal of the attacks on the Palestinian population in most of the cases continued beyond winning the, the winning the battle, winning, winning the war. When the war actually ended and the Palestinians finished their uh, bullets and the, the, the withdrawed or uh, were defeated, the uh, Zionist groups continue uh, the attack and they uh, uh, expelled the civilians and the families outside of their houses and their neighborhoods and their cities which is very important to understand the, uh, um, uh, the, the purposes beyond the attack. It's not only uh, as a defense attack in order to stop firing uh, the, uh, uh, the Zionist side or the uh, Jewish neighborhoods. That's correct. Some of the Palestinian armed groups uh, um, uh, shoot it towards the Jewish uh, neighborhoods that were close to to Manshiya, to, to, to Jaffa. They didn't have any plan to occupy Tel Aviv or to expel the people of Tel Aviv. They just wanted to, uh, uh, to disturb the Zionist project and to attack Jewish or Zionist uh, um, uh, institutions or, or neighborhoods. But in the Zionist side had uh, fully uh, uh, organized plans and they were well armed and well prepared in order to achieve this achievement like we see in this, uh, what we see in this uh, photo. This is the same neighborhood, Manshia in 1948 and Manshia in the end of 1948, most of the houses were destroyed um, as a result of bombing by the Ergun uh, organization. The operation of uh, orbicides that was taken from genocide and domicide to destroy the houses, to destroy the neighborhood, to destroy the ability of living in these neighborhoods, like what Israel is doing now in Gaza, started already in 1948. The people of Al Manshiya, even if they wanted to, to return to their houses or to their neighborhood, they would not find houses to live in uh, anymore. This should start uh, from 
from the from the beginning from the zero ground. One side of the uh, uh, of the Zionist I see that uh, someone called Shai is uh, rushing the screen. Um, um, in the in the photo, in the yellow one in the top of the screen, you see a, a very a famous uh, piece that was painted by famous Zionist painter called Nahum Gutman. And he painted the beginning of Tel Aviv, modern houses of the neighborhood of Tel Aviv, and the old city of Jaffa in the end of the uh, of the piece, you see the tower of the church of St. Peter, but between them, he saw nothing. In fact, the neighborhood of Manshi and other neighborhoods of Palestinian neighborhoods were between um, uh, these locations, but he uh, decided to show that the area is empty. The area has nothing except maybe some oriental uh, old city and modern Tel Aviv Jewish neighborhood and nothing between them. And he just avoided the Palestinian urban modern neighborhoods like Manshi and the other neighborhoods that were destroyed. And in these days, if you visit this area, we we'll see the promenade of Tel Aviv actually covering the neighborhood of Manshi, the neighborhood of Manshia, and they created the Charles Crow Park and uh, this uh, area that we see in the photo on our right and the bottom of the of the screen. And this, I think, four stages of uh, uh, the neighborhood of Manshie can reflect the ideology and the practices of the Zionist movement towards the majority of the Palestinian localities by saying it was empty. And in fact, they emptied it and destroyed it and erased it and built uh, a new Israeli and uh, uh, Hebraized uh, view and, and, and neighborhood. So this attack that started in uh, 25th of April, 1948, continued to the uh, middle of May, 1948. In the beginning, it was the smaller organization that called the Irgun, but the Haganah, the, the, uh, um, the main organization, that led by David Ben-Gurion continued the occupation of the city of Jaffa, bombing the city from outside for about three weeks. And the city uh, actually was expelled under these uh, uh, bombings, weeks of bombings. Um, uh, we have uh, many testimonies of Palestinian refugees that describing these moments and these days uh, till they uh, had to flee and to leave uh, their um, their city, uh, even Abu Iyad, who became uh, the one of the leaders and the members of the PLO uh, that was assassinated by Israel in Tunisia, um, uh, he was formerly from from Jaffa, and he found himself and his family in Gaza after he was expelled from the city of Jaffa, and uh, in, he said that in May thirteen in May thirteenth. Uh, 48, less than 24 hours before the declaration of the State of Israel, my family fled from Jaffa to escape by sea under a shower of shells from the uh, Jewish uh, artillery. The massacre in Deir Yassin, which happened about one month before, caused terror among the uh, my people. Uh, before every attack, uh, they would warn the uh, the residents, the Palestinian residents, that their fate will be like the fate of the people of Deir Yassin if they will not evacuate uh, uh, their place. So this psychological war using the massacres in other places uh, was very useful in order to push the people to flee and to uh, leave their places. Thousands, even Tens of thousands of Palestinians were pushed towards the seaport of Jaffa, and they jumped to any boat or any ship in order to look for a shelter or to go far away uh, from the city of Jaffa under bombing. Thousands of them were taken by the boats to the uh, um, to the north towards Beirut in Lebanon, 
but thousands, many thousands of them were taken to Gaza. And these photos, at least the one of the bottom, is when they arrived the port of Gaza in 1948, looking for a shelter in the city of Gaza. And within less than one month, within three weeks, the city of Jaffa, that had more than 70,000 people, and the district of Jaffa, that had about 120,000 people, were actually uh, uh, the this area where uh, was emptied, and the more than 95% of population were forcibly expelled. The Palestinian writer Tamami al Akhal, writer and painter Tamami al Akhal, uh, formerly from, uh, originally from Jaffa, living in Jordan, she uh, met in 1997. Uh, families from Jaffa that still live in Jaffa, survivors that still live in Jaffa. And she told them that she saw when she was a child uh, in the seaport that uh, soldiers were close to the uh, seaport of Jaffa and they shoot it towards the people. Uh, she saw the area full with blood. And, uh, um, and, and she saw as a child uh, killed people in the area of the uh, of the seaport, but she herself was lucky and he and his family uh, jumped to a boat and they uh, just fled and lived um, and left the, uh, the city. At the same time, almost a few weeks after, David Ben-Gurion and the Israeli government deciding uh, um, uh, that the Palestinian refugees will not return. In May 16th, in a, a, an um, a official decision, uh, the Israeli government said that the Palestinian refugees will be prevented, or well, their return will be prevented. And uh, David Ben-Gurion uh, said in that uh, meeting, especially towards Jaffa, he said, we should settle Jaffa, uh, he meant by Jewish uh, uh, families, and uh, war is a war. Um, returning the Arabs to Jaffa is not justified um, um, and I will be supporting the decision that they will not return even after the war will end. Very similar to the uh, declaration of the Israeli leaders in these days regarding Gaza, or at least the desire of the, some of the leaders in, uh, in regarding Gaza. Omar? Yes, please. You had asked me to let you know when we have about 10 minutes to go. Uh, so oh. I just wanted to make a note as your transition. There's never okay. enough time, I know. And so that. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, only 3,900 3, people, about 4,000 4, Palestinians, remained in the city of Jaffa from the city itself and from the neighboring villages around. 95% of the population, as I said, were already were expelled. And these 4,000 were concentrated in one area in the city of Jaffa, in one neighborhood that called Ajami neighborhood. In the map, if you read Arabic, is the one before uh, Jabalia neighborhood on the beach in the uh, southern part of the city of Jaffa. They closed this neighborhood with fence, you can see in this photo, black and white photo, the um, uh, defense of the ghetto. This area, this closed area was named the ghetto by the Israelis officially, and the Palestinians that survived the expulsion were actually present in this, in this area for about one year and a half. And then this was released and uh, the ghetto was destroyed. But it's amazing that they used the term ghetto in order to describe uh, this uh, this area. Um, on the right, we can see the cover of one of the files in the, from the Israeli archives that saying that clearly uh, the, the Israeli government, the uh, Ministry of Minorities, and the title of the file is transferring Arabs to security zones to the ghetto. And it, it was not only in Jaffa, but in the other big cities, that small number of Palestinians remained in the, um, in the city, like in Ramli, in Lid, 
uh, even in Akka and Akir, uh, in Haifa without fence, but it was clearly where the Palestinians uh, that remained in Haifa uh, can live. Only 3,000 people among 70,000 people from Haifa remained in the city. The numbers in the big cities are very similar. By the way, this is this was a very important step when the Zionist movement and the state of Israel destroyed totally the Palestinian city. Inside the Green Line, we didn't uh, uh, remain with Palestinian big city. All these cities were destroyed and ethnically cleansed. We uh, remained only with small villages and uh, maybe the city of Nazareth that was not so important before 1948 became or forced to become the uh, uh, the city of the Palestinians, the Palestinian minority inside uh, the state of Israel. But this uh, way of smashing the Palestinian city actually part of destruction of the Palestinian collective identity and collective uh, possibility uh, uh, to be developed um, as a nation or as a collective um, uh, community. Uh, Salim Tamari, one of the Palestinian uh, uh, historians, uh, and, um, originally from Jaffa, uh, after 1948, the city of Jaffa became really the uh, backyard of the city of Tel Aviv, neglected, dirty, partly destroyed, uh, a city of crimes. This is what Salim Tamari describes. In, 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 it became from the, the bride of Palestine, the king of the... the the Prince of Palestine uh, um, uh, to the um, spot of the hash of the uh, drugs of Israel. And this is the situation of Jaffa for many years, till at least the, um, uh, the 70s. Sorry. Um, very fast, if we go now to Jaffa, we'll see what remained despite the eraser, the process of erasing the Palestinian identity, but the city is still strong. And if you look for evidences of the life of the Palestinian uh, uh, city before 48 and before the destruction, you will see that and you can find that. You can find the uh, Hassan Beg Mosque in the middle of Israeli touristic area in the promenade of Tel Aviv without any community or any how or Palestinian houses among high buildings and hotels that still stand it till today after many years of, um, of attacks and, uh, um, and destruction. It was renovated during the 90s and now it's uh, um, um, operated as a, as a mosque, but yeah, in very strange situation inside. It looks inside Tel Aviv. Uh, but it's the evidence and it's the proof that Jaffa uh, reached that uh, that area. On the beach of Tel Aviv, south, five minutes walk of the Hassan Beit Mosque, you will see the museum of the Irgun, of this organization that occupied and expelled the neighborhood of Manshi, um, getting a Palestinian house uh, and um, uh, designing it as, actually it's more than one house, it's three houses, designing them as a museum for the heritage of this organization that, by the way, uh, considered by the British government as a terror organization and the leaders of the organization were wanted by the British law. And they believe that the state of Israel should be built not only in whole Palestine, but also in Palestine and uh, Jordan. And their logo is decorating the entrance of the museum in the center of the promenade of Tel Aviv till today, kind of legitimizing this idea. Uh, we will see the uh, the building of the, um, uh, the train station that's still standing, but with no train station, it's not uh, working there anymore since the, um, the 90s. Um, some of the uh, the great mosque that was also re renovated in the twenty the, the years of the two thousands, uh, the old city, the seaport, and very beautiful things that we still see in the city of Jaffa. At the same time of expulsion, the city of Jaffa, many villages in the district of Gaza 
were occupied and the population were expelled. Not the city of, Jaffa, of Gaza, but the villages mainly in the north of the, the city of Jaffa and uh, in east, the city of Jaffa. In the district of Jaffa, there are about 45 Palestinian villages that had been uh, expelled in 1948, and all these refugees were pushed to the what became Gaza Strip. So what we see in the map on our left, the small part in green that called Gaza Strip was not existing before 1948. It was created as a result of the Israeli occupations in the area around the city of, uh, of Gaza. Um, even in 1949, Israel and Egypt took one more piece of the Gaza Strip and annexed that to Israel and uh, instead of 550 kilometers square, the Gaza Strip became only 365 kilometers square. In this area that became the Gaza Strip, used to live till 1948, about 60,000 people in Gaza and Rafah and Deir el balah and the other uh, towns around Gaza. This area forced to accept 20, 100,000 Palestinian refugees, more than three times of the number of the original population in the, in the Strip of Gaza, which is amazing. How come this small area can give space and life and place for so big number of Palestinian refugees that came from the area around the Gaza District, from the Naqab area, the Negev, some from the city of Ramleh, some of them the city of, uh, of uh, Lid, and also in Majdal, which is Ashkelon, Ashdod, Asdod, and also from Jaffa. And again, we can see the disconnection in, um, um, in, in, in tragedy between Jaffa and Gaza that many refugees from Jaffa forced to move towards Gaza. And some of the families from Jaffa were split some remained in Jaffa from this small number of the survivors, and some reached uh, uh, the, uh, the Gaza Strip. In this small strip, the United Nations intervened and the Egyptian government and the Palestinian leadership, and they built uh, um, uh, um, eight official refugee camps for the Palestinian refugees. The biggest one uh, is Jabalia refugee camp and Rafah refugee camp. Tens of thousands of people living in these camps in very hard uh, conditions in Gaza Strip since 1948. But the Palestinian refugees took with them also their original identity. And they built in the refugee camps a mini city, a mini town, a mini village of their original place, at least um, uh, in, their, uh, in their vision uh, in their memory, they, they, they kept the memory through giving the same name of their original city to neighborhoods, to quarters in the in the camps, to a mosque that like this building in on, on, on the left. I'm not sure if it's still standing till today because it was attacked. The, it's called the Mosque of Jaffa in Jabalia camp, refugee camp in Gaza. On, on our uh, right, we'll see the sign of the supermarket of Jaffa, also in Jabalia uh, refugee camp. This was one of the practices how the Palestinian refugees maintained the connection to their original place that um, uh, they insist to return to uh, till today. I will skip this uh, stations of the Gaza Strip history, but uh, in, in, between 1949 and 1967, it was under the Egyptian control and it was occupied once again by Israel in 1967. And since that time, it's under Israeli occupation in different forms, even it was a, a, a kind of withdrawal of Israel when they dismantled the, set the settlements from Gaza Strip and withdrew uh, to the borders of the Gaza Strip, but they still and they continued to control the life in Gaza and almost everything in Gaza, and they committed uh, a blockade <clears throat> on Gaza 
uh, since 19, since 2007. And as we saw that 70% of the population in Gaza Strip are actually refugees from 1948 expulsion. And they insist to their right to return based on the United Nations Solution 194 and the international law and other inter international conventions. Um, uh, um, in 2018, they started uh, the return march demonstrations in very close to the, to the fence with Israel demanding their return. And the idea of implementing the return um, um, came up as um, uh, an elite uh, um, uh, case uh, among architectures and students that started designing and imagining the return to the destroyed places in, in Palestine 48 inside Israel. And uh, uh, one of the uh, mentors of this uh, paradigm of imagining the return, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta himself is a Palestinian refugee from the area of the Naqab, organizing for the last six years kind of competition between uh, Palestinian students, uh, asking them to design or to um, plan a return to one of the destroyed Palestinian uh, villages. Uh, two years ago, the winner of this competition, uh, the first prize went to Maha, uh, um, <clears throat> um, Maha Jamal, um, I, I was just in that uh, event in, in, that happened took place in Zoom, and I, we talked to her and saw her project. Uh, she planned a return to a, a village in the Galilee that called Suhmata, and uh, she got the prize, and unfortunately, uh, three months ago, she was killed in one of the Israeli bombing in, in Gaza. So when David Ben-Gurion said in 1920s that if Jaffa went to hell, I would not count myself mourning um, um, or among the uh, mourners uh, on this city. Uh, regarding Gaza, uh, the former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin said in 1929, I wish I could wake up one day and find that Gaza has sunk into the sea. I don't know what the plan of Israel in these days regarding Gaza, but we heard a lot of declarations and uh, uh, visions of Israeli leaders talking about smashing Gaza, expulsion of the population of Gaza, uh, settling Gaza, Judaizing Gaza. I'm not sure that it will succeed this time, but at least the ideology of beyond these attacks and uh, uh, brutal um, uh, uh, attacks on Palestinian communities that taking place in these days against Gaza, um, unfortunately, is not a new one. It started at least 76 years ago. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it was longer than we planned. That's so poignant and important. Thank you for your expertise, your scholarship, your perspective, um, and most importantly, also for highlighting the ways that what's happening now, what happened in the past and what can happen in the future, both for good and bad, are all connected. That what happened in Jaffa in 1948 and what's happening today in Gaza are connected in conversation and part of one historical process and one historical project, which is the ongoing Nakba. Um, and I, just for myself, teasing out some of the connections uh, and historical ref resonances that you pointed out is so useful. Here, learning and hearing about Ghetto Ajami um, is useful when thinking about Gaza, of course, since 2007, sometimes referred to as Ghetto Gaza. Uh, learning about the thousands displaced to Gaza and understanding that the people now being displaced from the north to the south 
of Gaza, many of whom are now in Rafa, uh, are people also displaced from Jaffa and throughout 48. Um, all of these things are very important in our conceptualization of the current moment and what it demands and what justice and future can look like. Um, and so moving to see Maha's plan, vision, brilliance, imagination, um, and creativity, concrete, practical creativity and imagining what Jaffa could look like in the future for herself and others and her community. Um, we don't have so much time for questions. Um, practically from the audience, there was one question about how many Palestinians live in Jaffa today. Do you know or, or not off the top of your head? Um, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, the um, by the way, Jaffa was annexed to the municipal uh, area of Tel Aviv uh, in 1950, and it became a neighborhood of Tel Aviv. And so now you imagine the uh, the trauma of the Palestinians, the trauma of the Palestinians when they think about Jaffa before 48 and Jaffa uh, in, in, under Tel Aviv. And uh, during the time, it was settled by uh, mainly Jewish families. Some Palestinians from other places came to Jaffa for work and uh, different uh, jobs. In these days, there are about 90,000 people living in Jaffa. 30,000 are Palestinian Arabs and about 60,000 are Israeli Jewish. Thank you. Um, and for those who are looking to learn more about Jaffa and its past and present, I'll try to send some more resources along with the recording of this event uh, tomorrow or the next day. We also in Green Olive talked with Abed Abu Shahade um, in recent months about the conditions in Jaffa and the crackdown on uh, free speech and popular assembly taking place since October and before. Um, and if people want to reach out to Umar, please also be in touch. And uh, of course, support. Um, is happy to lend the expertise and its perspective it's, and the invaluable work and research that they do to other projects looking to build a vision of justice, develop historical memory, and a vision of re practical return. Um, with that, unfortunately, we're out of time for today. Um, and I hope everyone uh, learned as much as I thought I did on this tour and will join in the future. Um, and I want to thank everyone here for joining on behalf of both Green Olive and Zuchot um, for being with us today from around the world. As I mentioned at the start of our event, we depend on contributions from you, our wider community, to cover the costs of our events and sustain our work to fundamentally shift the landscape of discourse around Israel-Palestine and raise local and transnational awareness about the violence of military rule and the ongoing Nakba. You can contribute at greenolivetours.com slash contributions, which I put into the chat. And today's contributions will be split with Sukhot and also sustain their invaluable work to promote historical memory, awareness about the events of 1948, and the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Your contributions will allow the Green Olive Collective to develop global campaigns, encouraging people around the world to take action in 2024. They will allow us to sustain our material support communities facing displacement in Area C, to sustain a robust infrastructure of solidarity, advocacy, and action in the coming year, um, and to create and develop new international campaigns in direct support of communities facing land expropriation and settler violence. We hope you will take what you heard today as a charge towards action in a moment in which we as a global community must do everything we can to demand an immediate ceasefire and future of equality between all inhabitants of Israel and Palestine. Now is the time to write to your elected officials, sign petitions, demonstrate, attend town halls, disrupt meetings, act in civil disobedience, share what you learned today with your peers, and do all we can to amplify the voices of Palestinians and Israelis, calling for a lasting peace, equality, and the universal right to home and safety. We hope everyone here has good and peaceful days, and we send all of our support to all of you around the world calling for justice. We will send a recording and resources tomorrow and hope to see everyone soon. Uh, Una, thank you for joining today. Um, much appreciated and look forward to the future working together more. Uh, have wonderful days, everyone. See you soon.